other types of uh, surgery on the actor's surface. So therefore, and, it, and there's, a, there's a very large literature on HA use in uh, ocular surgery as well as in various dry eye conditions. There are many types of HA tears available, and it's actually quite difficult to tell them apart just looking at the packaging or the labeling. And there may be additional ingredients to HA which augment its performance, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. We actually, uh, in the laboratory, collected a large number of different HA products. These are all European products, so the names may not be necessarily the same as those found here in India. And we uh, did an initial analysis using mass spec uh, analysis to look at the molecular weight. And we found that a few of the products could be classified as high molecular weight or more than 1,000 kilodaltons. Many of them were medium, between 500 and 1,000 kilodaltons, and also a fair larger number were small molecular weight HA less than 500 kilodaltons. High molecular weight is considered more preferred due to its larger viscoelasticity and also its lack of potential immunological in, uh, activity. In addition to the molecular weight itself, the polydispersion index was also measured. That's the, the purity, basically, of the polymer, and a narrower or smaller number is considered more, more suitable. This is, can be related directly to the dynamic viscosity again, and uh, this is the same uh, axes with viscosity going vertical and the, uh, the shear thinning or um, uh, shear rate going uh, along the, the horizontal axis. All of the HA solutions show this shear thinning, a drop in viscosity as the shear rate becomes higher. Shear rate is simply the moving of the surfaces across each other, and this happens during a blink on the eye or in the instrument due to a spinning disc. If you look at the low shear viscosity, we see that there's a spread of amongst these different uh, uh, products, and it's not entirely predicted by that molecular weight graph on the previous one, where the blue ones are all, blue ones tend to be towards the top. Those are the high molecular weight, the green and the gray, however, are highly mixed in the lower part of the graph. Now, most of the products are in the lower half of this viscosity graph, and that's because they're below what, what I would label as a blur limit. Uh, products that are formulated above that line uh, tend to, to produce blur in most patients. And when, when my group went to formulate a new HA product, we formulated it with a relatively enhanced viscosity but still below the blur line so the patients wouldn't experience that blur at all. The, you can see a relationship between molecular weight and the viscosity when you multiply the molecular weight times its actual concentration. And then you get a pretty much a linear relationship for pure HA products. On the other hand, some products uh, that, which are enhanced with other polymers uh, deviate from this line. And uh, so you can enhance the performance of HA by combining it with other polymers. Another product, another uh, characteristic of these products which affects the performance of the HA polymer is the total osmolarity and the sodium content. Most products are, and the sodium content, and this is sodium content vertically and total osmolarity horizontally, there's a rough correlation between it. In other words, the amount of total osmolarity is determined by the amount of salt added to the solution. Some deviate, such as in the circle, and this is the one that, uh, that my group has formulated. The reason we formulated them with very low sodium was because of this fact. It turns out that when you add sodium, it destabilizes the HA polymer. The de destabilized HA polymer no longer has the same performance uh, in terms of viscoelasticity uh, with extra salt. So the green line there is with, with, with non-electrolytes or compatible solutes, which are or organic solutes instead of salt, and the blue line is with added salt and it drops the viscosity. So you can see that an optimum uh, HA uh, formulation should not contain very much sodium. So the ones up here at the top with more sodium would be less preferred. How does this relate to clinical performance? In testing and clinical performance, we found that products with HA perform better than ones without. And in this case, our HA product is one that also has CMC in it, which is enhancing that that formula. We found that, for example, that 0.1% HA 
performs just as well as 0.15 percent provided you use a high molecular weight HA and you supplement it with the CMC. So here we have both products looking at ocular surface staining performing better than a CMC only product. Because of the binding site to CD44 and its uh, superior properties, HA products tend to outperform non-HA products for, for surgical uh, post-surgery patients. Here in cataract surgery, we see improved, better symptoms, uh, recovery, and less staining and breakup time than in non-HA uh, patients. And uh, similarly, in post-LASIK patients, while both the CMC only product and the HA with CMC product showed uh, a, a return of normal to symptoms after three months. The visual recovery, the, un, the uncorrected vi distance visual acuity, uh, actually s recovered much faster with the HA product as compared with the CMC product. This is at the one month visit, we saw the significant change. So there's a faster recovery of visual acuity following LASIK with this. Finally, and even in contact lens wear, we saw better performance with the HA product than with CMC. So in summary, we would recommend, therefore, a high molecular weight HA polymer, uh, addition of additional ingredients such as CMC to it, enhances ocular retention, avoiding sodium chloride, look, and looking for compatible solutes instead, and also uh, products that have been demonstrated to re relieve the signs and symptoms of your patients in controlled clinical trials. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk. So without further ado, I, I think, could we take questions at the end or sure. we, we could, if there's, uh, yeah. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rohit Shetty, Professor Doyen in Keratoconus Management, to give his talk yeah. on uh, why is my outcome unusual? Thank you. Ready? If there are any questions, you can also interrupt in, in yes. the middle of the talks. Thank you. <coughs> and um, I, because I have uh, to moderate one more session, so I thought I'll just, uh, at the end of this, that session is going to be the end. So I thought I'll just start my talk. Usually, in a normal keratoconus ICs, we go by a flow. I mean, the, what is KC, what is uh, cross-linking and these things. But I think this crowd has already been doing things. So we just had to go into the very specific details of what problems we face. It's more of a problem-based learning uh, kind of a uh, meeting is what we, uh, what we plan to do. These are my financial interests, which I get to receive grants from. These questions are the ones which keeps coming to us when we are doing cross-linking. I'm getting more haze. My outcome is, I do not know what my outcome is. I have, I'm not really sure whether I have an infection or an infiltrate or an excessive reaction. I'm not getting a proper demarcation line. What is progression? So whole idea of this next uh, 45 minutes of me and my colleagues who are going to speak is trying to understand each one of them and trying to give a reason. Why do you get all this? Why do I see all this? The first question <coughs> which needs to be answered is, should we consider keratoconus as a non-inflammatory disease? That's the first basic question. Once you answer this question, either way, we will probably get an answer which, is, which will help you to manage your patients better. It's a simple surgery, but outcomes are quite different. We assume because it's quite easy for us today to just say that we'll come back after a year or two, we'll know what's happening. Patients are going to come back. They're very young. They're going to come back to you for the rest of their life. And if you're not knowing something, it's criminal. So there are different ways of how people rub their eyes. And for the last 150 years, this has been the, the mainstay of how KC was looked at. You rub your eyes, you get keratoconus. You don't rub your eyes, you don't. We know that it's not true. So it's always been a question of chicken and egg, which we don't know which comes first. Do you rub your eyes and then get KC, or KC makes you to rub eyes? So from a very cell biologist point of view, this was a paper by one of my fellows. He presented it yesterday, 
what really drives keratoconus? This is a very favorite paper of mine, even though they didn't win, doesn't matter. But it is important because we, this paper looked at why do you rub your eyes? So when we looked at uh, all this part, all this test, what we did with some microarray analysis with the tears and all that, we found that patients who did not have any eye, eye disease, this is a grade of keratoconus, we can test Ig in the tears. That was, you can see that it looks like your topography, it is high. That means that patients who have no allergy, who are otherwise asymptomatic, still have a high levels of uh, tears which matches with your grade of keratoconus. So the pathology just may not be an allergy, but pathology could be something inherent, something the patients may have uh, some atopic tendencies. And when we compared with the uh, keratoconus with allergic eye disease, the, the grades did not really match. It was not as simple as uh, we see in this. So the translation, translation application is I'm just going by questions. Why do you rub your eyes? Because either before surgery or after surgery, we are always very keen on rubbing the eye business. So when you ask a patient and he says that he's rubbing your eyes and he still does not have any symptoms, it is important that you have to manage it like an allergy, even though you don't have a classical forms of uh, allergy out there. Or when patients do have something else, which, but not the eye allergy, we have to manage it systemically. We have some cases on this uh, in the end of the presentation, so I'm not going deep into this, but the role of immunologist, basically to answer why do I, what do I do when my patient rubs the eye before or after cross-linking, the first thing is you have to manage it with one important person is immunologist. You have to find immunologist, a physician, whoever has an interest in immunology, you need to keep them on the board. It's like for a keratoconus person, if you're doing a lot of keratoconus work, one thing I request you to do is to find a good physician or immunologist or any allergist person who can help you out. When you look at predictors of good and bad cross-linking and what is good and what is bad, for that, you have to understand that the eye, the keratoconus or your normal cornea, this, this applies, the same model applies for refractive surgery also. There are cross-linking agents already existing in your eye. They call the uh, lysyl oxidase is one of the known ones, but there are many more compounds. That means that your eye is getting cross-linked as we move on. Who is doing the cross-linking? We are not using riboflavin all the time. It's because that there are proteins, there are cells, there are machinery which God has provided us to cross-link all through your life. And it's not only in your eye, it's in your skin and every other part of the body, wherever it's required. So what really happens is each person in keratoconus has different level of these proteins. All of them may not have the same proteins or all of them may not have the same endogen. We call it as endogenous cross-linkers, which is inherent. It's like an endogenous endophthalmitis. It is something to do with your inherent property of your eye. So I, I gave my defense for my PhD on this, this is my favorite slide, about each and every molecule which actually kind of blocks it. If you really look at it, it looks like a busy slide, but this actually is the foundation of your outcomes. Even, even if you don't want to know why this disease is, it's like your outcome. For example, you rub your eyes, you have a biological stimuli, that will change your uh, epithelial barriers, once you change the epithelial barriers, the more of inflammation goes in. More of inflammation causes, again, release of a loop mechanism, the very cells, then it goes back again. Then it, all your inflammation which goes back reduces your lysyl oxidase, collagen, and once it happens, your, it shuts down your endogenous cross-linker. Basically, what it does is uh, it's, it just shuts down this. That means once you shut it down, even if you do cross-linking every year, it's not going to work. That's the beauty of uh, knowing these pathways and then a feedback mechanism. It's, this is exactly what happens. And this is how new drugs, new therapies, new molecules are found. Because if you can block all of them, for example, if you can block uh, inflammation killing your cells, you don't need cross-linking. The cells itself can regenerate. That's the beauty of our human system. So many times you need all these procedures because you are 
trying to actually induce from outside. Anything which you induce n not naturally is not going to last long. So to answer the question, we looked at a lot of factors. The cornea itself, which I just mentioned, the genetics, the tear film. I mean, these all factors play an important role in predicting why is your outcome good, why is your outcome bad. And the, without them, your outcomes, it is not your machine. The most important thing I want to take, give a take home point from this talk or my colleague's talk is there is no problem with your machine or technique. It's a very simple procedure. Outcome differs because of these four arms here. Your genetics, your molecular factors, your tear film and your nutrition status. And for the next few slides, this is what I'm going to talk on. This, my colleague made this video for, uh, for the ASCRS. He talks about three important things your genes, what you get. That's why it's very important to look at your, when a child comes and you're not sure whether the child is going to get keratoconus or not, or whether you want to do operate now or later, the best indicator is your parents. You do a scan of, your, of the child's parents. For example, this person is having keratoconus and you don't know whether to jump now and do it or not. We may have uh, algorithms, but when you do your parents, her parents, and if the parents have a signs of aborted keratoconus or a from first keratoconus, you know it's genetics. See, so that's how you know that your outcome is going to be good or bad. Epigenetics is your inflammation. You, so it's your environment, the way you live, where you work. Eye rubbing is just a mix of, it's a trigger. So for example, I don't know. So what does this model teach us? How, does we, how do we take this model to the next level? It helps us to understand that the most important thing about this model, when you have a bad outcome or a good outcome, you had to go back and ask all this question. There's something called as a white inflammation, which we need to keep in mind, where you don't have inflammation, the signs of inflammation, but it's still happening. The work is still happening. Your immunity, immunity is driven by your nutrition. We are the only clinicians who do not ask for all these things, all the nutrition status when we operate. We assume that is not needed, but you need it. And that's that's what I do. So ideally you have to look at biomarkers and all these factors which you have mentioned in the past, but it's not, we are not in an ideal situation. Do we have, so what we do is we look at an op op ocular surface disease score for these patients. If it's high, MMP9 kits are available, but again, it's pretty costly, so it do, it's not practically right. So most important thing is look at the systemic factors Ask a detailed history, be a good listener. Do you rub your eyes? Which side do you sleep on? See, there are patients who have unilateral keratoconus. They have high IgE and they keep sleeping on one side and their eye, that eye increases because they may be having allergy to bed bugs. They may be having allergy to cotton. They may be having allergy to factors which made them to trigger. So that is what we need to look at. We also looked at this paper. This was my, one of my first papers where now it's picking up. Uh, what happens is when you have all this inflammation, it's changing the collagen. So your cross-linking sometimes don't really work. So we started giving them cyclosporin drops. Cyclosporin drops did reduce the MMP9 activities. And, we, and this paper was published in IVOBS 2015. And it says that there is still a role of when you don't, when you want to wait for a patient and you tell them you come back after six months or one year, you know, we don't give them anything. The patient still rubs his eyes, there's still the inflammation is on. So what I do is I give them, sometimes if they say that they have an eye rubbing, I had to block one part of it, like an epigenetic part of it. Then giving a cyclosporin drops does help. And we have shown that the topography also stabilizes because it changes your collagen. Anything which changes your collagen will stabilize your topography. Anything which changes your lysyl oxidase, which is an endogenous cross-linker, will stabilize it. So in a child, giving this drops also, at this point of time, we don't have more targeted approach, which works only on collagens or locks, but giving this still helps to improve your outcome. And this is what happens when you give them. For this is a patient who was posted before surgery. You can see those are dendritic cells, the nerves are inflamed. We gave them the, the dendritic cells reduces. And once you know that you cooled it down, I call it preparing the bed for the surgery. You have to prepare the bed, prepare the patient for the surgery because if you do it in this phase, 
your outcome will be like haze, pain, irritation, epithelial defect not resolving, uh, persistent uh, erosions, everything you want will get it because the eye is inflamed. So I'm, I'm taking you from a different angle. <coughs> When we say, when, especially when we are removing an epithelium and we say that as smooth as butter, it just comes so easily. I don't use alcohol, I don't use, I try to use lasers only in special conditions. But as a scientist, you should always say what, what temperature. Because this is, the reason I said about this is, imagine there are two ways of removing an epithelium. One comes very easily when you're doing cross-linking, PRK, whatever you want. One day when we were doing this, I said, which one should I be happier? Most obviously, people will say, this is what I should be happy of, because it comes so easily like a capsulorexis. And, uh, but when we did this study, we noted this uh, patients, and we graded it into, based on tactile, there's no grading system. One which comes easy, one which comes quite tough, because it was in the same hand with no alcohol. And we looked at the outcome. We took those epithelium and we started, uh, we did the analysis also. So what happens is when you have an tears, when you have an epithelium which comes off very easily, it also heals differently because epithelium which comes easily is filled with the inflammation. They are patients who had chronic eye rubbers, the healing is different and we assume that they also would end up with having more scarring. So epithelial removal, when you are actually doing an epithelial removal, it gives you a great insight into probably looking at what I should do. So when I see epithelium coming loose and when I tell, when I document, when we document in our file that epithelium has come out loose, I tell them, let's start the patient on long-term steroids for them because he's going, to, he's going to get scarring, he's going to have a slow healing. We'll start on tablet doxycycline because doxycycline works on MMP9s. It works on a lot of these inflammatory molecules and we keep them on cyclosporine for at least six to eight months. The reason is I know that these patients would heal differently from an epithelium which is hard. That is the first sign of when you're actually doing a procedure. That's the first time because that's the reason I said do not be always conscious. There's a difference between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is not aware of the present. The conscious mind is aware of the present. So that when you're removing an epithelium, the conscious mind should be active because you'll pick up the most beautiful thing which will help you greatly in your outcome. And this is what we found. I wanted to do this because, see, gut feeling you had, it works that way, but we just wanted to do this and prove it that what we are saying is right. That means the loose epithelium were filled with more inflammation. The always question is what is normal and abnormal based on what we saw. The mechanism of haze is all about, I showed you the dendritic cells, the abomance changes, how you activate and all this. It is not always your calibration machines. People say, okay, my machine is wrong or my riboflavin is wrong. I'm getting more haze, more. It's not always there. Do not keep blaming yourself for the factors which is beyond your, hand, beyond your uh, limits because these things is difficult to understand. But I'm presenting it because we start I just want to do one thing is to stop blaming everything on ourselves or machines. So for example, demarcation line. Demarcation line is nothing but the graveyard of keratoconus, a graveyard of keratocytes where they die. And each procedure has a different thing. For example, once you do immediate, this is pre-cross-linking, I did confocals on them. Immediately after you do a cross-linking, you, you have keratocytes die, 90 microns, and they take at least uh, one month for them to recoup, regenerate to the same level. So what really happens is this is your graveyard. You see that there is no keratocytes, you see refractiles being, they're all collagen. It's the only time you see collagen because there is change in your refractive index at that point of time and confocal picks it up and this is, and so that having a lower or upper does not mean that you're doing great. It just means that you, how your wound is healing. So keratocyte death does not always indicate a great procedure. It, in that person, your wound healing is different. Some person may not have a death of keratocytes at all. He may have a different way of it. The reason is, this is a work done by Natasha and when she was a fellow with me, it's about how the wound healing happens. There are molecular pathways of wound healing. And if you have more inflammation, your keratocytes death will be more. 
if you have less inflammation, your keratocyte death will be less. So when you go back tomorrow and see that if your patient had more eye rubbing, irritation, you'll see that your keratocyte's demarcation line is different. That means the person's immune tolerance makes him to have different depths of keratocyte's death because it is not the great thing to have death in your, in your eye because it has to regenerate. And you can see that this is the way the normal wound healing happens. It's even your PRK. PRK, just, she worked on PRK haze here. It was not on keratoconus, but it's the same. If you have your body's immune response triggers off how you're going to heal. That is why you get this normal and abnormal. And this is what happens when you have a bad one. Here, the keratoconus, myofibroblasts have not reconverted, it just made it into a scar. And this is exactly what happens when you have this patchy scarring. What we get is because these patients had a diffu different immune profile. And if you look at this, the immune profile is these patients have a different genetic profiling to cause scarring. Exactly same thing happens in the PRK and exactly same thing happens here also. So that is something, and vitamin D is a major factor. That's why I do it all for all my cross-linking patients. You can see that it helps to block the myofibroblast conversion. This is a major player. It, it is a very important player in converting a lot of wound healing, especially in your cornea. And you can see this is a pathway which has been published by Sam Chaurasian group uh, when he was uh, in Singapore, now he's in Colombia, I think. And so this is how it works. The question always is, which is stronger? Because we've always been inspired by this thing from Wollon Sachs' lab. Okay, you, you take a cornea like this, which is dull and fragile, suddenly it becomes stronger. Why are we not getting this? And that is a big question. We never see, none of us have seen this kind of a strength in a cornea. The reason is not the procedure, the reason is your machines. We do not have a machine yet which can pick it up. And when we started doing modeling, mathematical modeling used this, uh, uh, which Rushad had worked with me on this, we saw that it is picking up, it is showing a change, but not like the picture you saw in the previous pic previous scene. It's, it, it is a little different, but we need better tools like Brillion, which looks at every area of weakness and then how it takes it forward. The most important thing we need to know is, even though you have a keratoconus in your cornea, the pattern of disease is different. It's what is different in the cone is different in the periphery. So it does not really look at the same thing. So you have two different things in your cornea, even though you call label it as KC. What we said is the periphery of the cornea looks like a normal one in molecular signature, like cross, uh, like the collagen and other things. The center is what is, is different. So when we look at what really happens after us is like I mentioned about all this, I'm just going to rush in a minute. So if you have all these things happening, your lysol oxidase collagen still is a loop mechanism. It blocks it, your cross linking do not work. So what is important, how do I block this? Be very careful about treating them. This is how the lysol oxidase is in normal corneas. It makes it, it's like a rubber band. It holds your collagen strong. If there's no lysol oxidase, it's just floating around. The collagen is floating around, so you don't get cross-linking effect. When you have a video, it doesn't play. So you basically have to treat it. This is uh, what we do. Uh, post, I'm talking about after the procedure and then, or before the procedure, and then cross-link it. That is something which uh, we have to look at. So when the topography keeps changing, even after cross-linking is done, we call it as progression, but this is the definition of progression. I'm sure Roshad is going to talk, but more than one adapter, you have to understand there's a repeatability issue also of the machines. And this is a patient who progressed very rapidly after cross-linking, and we need to understand there's a huge, huge, huge factor of genetics out there. And please do not blame your machine and keep cross-linking all the time. All I do is when you have a progression, just take a parents and just do a topography, you will get the answer. Mother or father, one of them, the phenotype, would have had an aborted keratoconus, which probably they have never seen. Then you know that this, why this patient is progressing. Every single patient of mine who progresses has a definitive topography phenotype in the parents or grandparents or siblings. And you will, that is a very important test to be done when you do a, any procedure. Like I said, wait for at least the haze to go. I wait for at least two years to decide whether it's progressing or not because the haze and wound healing messes up everything. 
So till two years, please do not jump and label them as uh, progressors. And infections, dreaded, inf I mean, any, any procedures we can get infection. And what we publish is, I don't know why, but they become completely sense resistant to known bacterial antibacterials. Maybe cross-linking has to do with, I don't know, to oculoflora, but that is something which you need to know. So we explained a lot of this. Hopefully, the take-home point is understand that immune plays, immune healing in each person has got a different tolerance, and that plays the most important role in how you avoid or how you get it and how you manage this manage these things after procedure. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. We shall get to you. Yeah, I think there is a case on this, and uh, I didn't want to go too deep because I didn't want to take her presentation off. Uh, so I, I also had one question for sir. Vishal, um, uh, you can proceed on stage. So uh, how, what do you exactly tell patients regarding the immune workup and what are uh, the immune tests that you routinely do for your patients? Sir? That's the reason I started off my first slide. Do we still believe it's non-inflammatory? I don't believe it's non-inflammatory. So I tell my patient it's immune and inflammatory driven. So how do you, if you get a patient of uveitis which is chronic, it is the second attack of anterior uveitis, what would you do? You would manage, you would test him for an immune workup, right? You would get him an RA factor, you get him a collagen muscular disease. So you don't, exactly what would you tell the patient? That it's def, it looks like an immune problem to me, I want to check it out. So two things I do for them is I do an IgE and vitamin D. Both plays a very important role. Both have a uh, kind of, a, it's a devil's axis. And the reason I do only two is these things I can manage. And if they're vegetarian, I do a vitamin B12 because it changes a lot in um, the neuro, uh, neuropeptides. And neuropeptides are necessary for the regrowth of epithelium. Epithelium heals normally. There is no haze. The culprit is always the epithelium. Thank you, sir. Brilliant microscopy uses hydration as one of its factors to look at different levels of uh, changes in your the texture of your corneal collagens. It is like your topography. It takes different areas, whole cornea, and it tells you which area is strong, which area is weak. It is a hugely a research tool. For one patient, one eye, it takes 35 minutes to do. So you need it. It's very difficult. But there's a group uh, in US which we are working, hopefully next year we should be having it, where, we are, where they're trying to get a faster processor. It is nothing but a biomechanical tool, but your topography. Like how you have your topography map, it will tell you. But the Corvus has got an update now, which will be probably testing it from next month. It can check four superior, inferior, lateral, and temporal, where you can look at the biomechanics, but not more than that. But Brilliant will give you the whole area. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Vishal. He's going to be speaking on the overview of the five-point normogram for managing keratoconus. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. So for, we are going to move from the molecular aspect and its translational aspect to the pure clinical thing. So managing keratoconus can be divided primarily into five points or the five steps. So I'm going to discuss them in this five-point nomogram. So if you go to PubMed today and just write keratoconus, you are bombarded with 6,128 articles. I hope you will take a year to read all this. That doesn't matter. So we are going to simplify all this. So there is a need for a nomogram. Why? To answer when to do cross-linking. Should you do it at presentation or wait for progression? And if you have cross-linked or don't cross-link and a keratoconus patient present to you, when should you do a contact lens or which type or should you use just glasses? Should I use a eczema laser in keratoconus or how to plan intacts and how do I, when do I use intacts? When to straight away go for keratoplasty and which type? So all these things would be answered subsequently. So this is the article that we are talking about here and this is the aspect of that article. This may look complex to you. This is the five point nomogram. 
So as with any nomogram, when we develop a nomogram, we have to study the population. The demographics is the first thing we study. And, and when you look at demographics of keratoconus, we find out that it's primarily a disease of the young. It happens in the second to third decade. These keratoconus patients do present with a history of allergy. They have pe pe people who have atopic eye disease, people who have IgE mediated disease, who always are more susceptible to developing an ectectic disorder or a keratoconus. This was, this is known and has been published in Asian eyes also in all over the world. Now, these patients also have history of frequent change of glasses. So any person who's coming with a frequent cylindrical, frequent change of glasses, high cylindrical, you should be suspicious. Other factors which can affect keratoconus are pregnancy. You can have Down syndrome. You can have rare diseases like tepetoretinal degeneration and other things. So always taking all these into factors, we studied the seven year data from 2007 to 2014 for around 5,000 cases, 5,200 to be precise. We found that it was bilateral in most of us and primarily a bilateral disease of 97 patients with a slight female preponderance. Only around 7% were having a family positive history. As with other literature, it's a primarily a disease of a second and third decade. And a history of eye rubbing that we found in our Indian uh, thing was around 25% of the cases having a history of eye rubbing or an atopic eye disease. On the basis of all this, we developed this high risk uh, characteristics for progression and gave a scoring system to it. So a total score of more than eight by looking at these high risk characteristics meant that the patient had a high risk of progression. Six to eight are moderate risk of progression, less than six are low risk of progression. So what to do with this progression thing? So those who have a low to moderate risk of progression, we go to the step two of the treatment, which is doing glasses and contact lens in them. These glasses and contact lens are the mainstay for any keratoconus in any stage. Even if you operate them, even if you do cross-linking, you have to come back to these glasses or contact lenses. So this is a very important aspect. Those who have high risk of progression and progression definition would be discussed by Rushar need to go to the step three, which is doing cross-linking on them. So the cross-linking, these are the various protocols that have been studied. So the conventional protocol is the best method available till date. You can have do the accelerated ones also, but anything above uh, nine milliwatt per centimeter square of fluence is not indicated nowadays. It does not work. There are published studies. We do not recommend the trans or the uh, trans epithelial cross-linking anymore. These are the various commercially av available riboflavins. So looking at the thickness, people use, if the thickness is high, you can use a dextrin, uh, uh, riboflavin, dec riboflavin with dextrin, or you can now switch to the 0.1 riboflavin with HPMC nowadays. So as I told earlier, if you have a high risk of progression, you do cross-linking, uh, but you have to re visually rehabilitate with glasses or contact lenses. If there is a low risk, you have visually rehabilitated them, but still they progress, then do cross-linking and go back to them. But there will be small subset who would be glasses and contact lens intolerant. For them, you go to the next step. If your corneal thickness permits, you can use the topo-guided PRK, which is using an examer, laser, examer in basically regularizing the cornea. If they have not been cross-linked, you can do a simultaneous cross-linking. It is proven to be effective. If the 6 mm thickness permits, you can undergo, uh, you can take them through uh, intacts with or without cross-linking. So intacts, what are, intacts are basically the PMS, PMMA segments. Yeah. Okay. So I'll sk skip this slide. So this, this article has also been published. So there will be a subset of patients who will come directly with scarring. So if the scarring is full thickness, you directly go to the penetrating keratoplasty. If the scarring is uh, partial thickness, you can do a dark in all, the, all of them. So these are the basic five steps of managing keratoconus. So if we go back to the, the whole flowchart, this can be 
now seen to be very easy. You can have demographics, classes, contact lenses, cross-linking, intacts. At all stages, to give them a final visual rehabilitation, you have to come back to the step two, which is giving them contact lenses. Thank you. I hope uh, this uh, presentation gave you clarity regarding managing keratoconus. Thank you. Anybody in this group is believer or doing uh, transepithelial cross-linking? Anybody here? Anand? One thing we should avoid is transepithelial cross-linking. The reason I never did that reason, even though many tempted, we have done few, but it, I got tempted to do it more because it's easy. The reason is, if you really look at, if you open that box and look at what it contains, it's like poison on the cornea. It has everything which can damage your cornea, epithelium. It's got uh, back, it's got uh, uh, EDTA. What really happened was all the children I did cross-linking transepithelial progressed faster than if you had not done anything. Then I was wondering what is happening. It's very simple. Imagine the eye is already inflamed. You're putting more inflammation to it. You are actually triggering off a cascade of event which is double than what is normal. So if you really look back at a lot of, uh, and I used the Vibex, uh, the, an original molecule of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, Vidro. It's not that we, we change that molecule. So that means that the transepithelial crossing in an Indian scenario, especially in an inflamed eye, it's asking for disaster because it's going to double the speed of progression. Because I saw, that's what I said, the whole cascade is 100 times more aggressive than not doing anything. So transepithelial is something which uh, I think we should be very careful about. So the next speaker is Rushad. The most important thing in any practice today is define a progression before or after cross-linking. Both ways progression works. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to present at this IC. So I'll be discussing the definition of keratoconus progression. Now, this is a very important aspect because it determines when we normally do cross-linking and how we proceed. So as you can see, these are various different presentations. Cross-linking is a safe and effective treatment as has been proved, but when do we actually need to do cross-linking? So progression is a specter looming in, in keratoconus and we need to define it properly. So what is the actual definition? Does it involve a change in refraction, pachymetry, a change in your contact len lens fitting, indices, change in the K-max or the K-mean or change in high order aberrations or does it involve in every one of these things together? Now, there was a global consensus on keratoconus and ectatic disease. However, this was kind of like an oxymoron because at the end of it, there was no real consensus. They said uh, progression may be a consistent change in at least two of the following parameters, which is steepening of the anterior corneal surface, posterior corneal surface and thinning or changes in the pachymetric range, uh, rate of change. Uh, this was a paper uh, published by Dr. Duncan's group. Now, they showed a very large number of parameters which can be looked at for looking at progression. However, none of these are actually validated. So, this, this also is not a correct definition for keratoconus progression. Uh, they also found that the ABCD classification brought in by Dr. Bellin is probably the, the indice which is the most sensitive to pick up keratoconus uh, progression which looks at the anterior and posterior radius of curvature and the thinnest pachymetry. And this is just a broad uh, s a slide showing how the classification is actually made. If we can go back because there's a lot of noise or not, I, I'm not saying noise, not of talk regarding the uh, uh, this ABCD classification because it is yeah. Yeah. yeah so if you really look at it 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 the new people are using pentacam you need to ask in case they are not loaded this to your machine I'm not sure whether they charge you but they charge you they charge for everything now so balance ABCD classification there are two things uh, there's the last one where you need to add uh, you, are, you have to write the patient refractive error, the D one, right? The distance corrected yeah, visual distance, acuity. Yeah, and then there's the PACI and the uh, PRC and ARC, which is already there in the machine. Uh, according to many, this is one of the most robust classification because it gets you the, the change in your uh, radius of curvature as well as the change in thickness. So, uh, but you know, not many papers have been published by anybody else apart from the same group. So more people will 
believe that this works good, then probably this could be an easy way of looking at it. You also have to be careful in this classification when looking at the distance corrected visual acuity that you look at it in the same way every time. You can't look at a glass in a contact lens the next time because that won't correlate. So that has to be taken care of uh, carefully. So we define progression as Sir had also mentioned earlier in, in our paper as an increase of uh, greater than 0.5 diopters at two or more keratometric values in the steep meridian between two sagittal curvature maps about six months apart, along with or a decrease in corneal thickness of greater than 10% at the thinnest point between two pachymetry maps on the pentacam in the last six months. So I'm just going to put up a few examples and we need to see whether this is actually progression. So if I can just ask in the audience, would you consider this as a, a progressive keratoconus and would you do a cross-linking for in this particular map? looking at it, the comparison map. So any answers from the audience? Uh, so Vishal says no, and that's the correct answer, basically because it, it assesses the repeatability. This scan is taken on the same date. It's two scans on the same date, five minutes apart. So basically, you have to be careful of the repeatability of a machine uh, when you're talking about progression as well. So. We published this paper in IOVS looking at the re repeatability and agreement of three Scheinflug based imaging systems. Uh, what we found was that haze post cross linking also plays an important role in determining whether there's progression or not. So if you do have a significant amount of haze, it's very difficult to comment on progression in these cases. As you can see here, there's a minimal amount of ha haze on the slit lamp. However, when you look at this on a densitometry map in the Pentacam again, and see it five months apart, there's a significant increase in the amount of haze. So in these kind of cases, it's kind of difficult to comment on progression, whether it's actually happening or not. Now again, another example, is this actually progression or is it not? I'm hiding a certain amount of the data in this, uh, in this slide. So again, in this, this was taken three months apart. Now three months after cross-linking, again, where haze is still playing a role, it might be difficult to uh, comment on progression. So again, you should wait as, as Dr. Rohit had also illustrated, at least a year or year and a half before commenting on progression. Uh, now, when commenting on comparison of two maps, we also need to take into account the best fit sphere that we're actually using for the comparison, as is highlighted by the two circles here. So this was a map done uh, in 2015, a Pentacam scan done for this patient. In 2016, when the patient came back, there was a change. However, there was also a change in the best fit sphere in this patient. Now, when you're compa comparing across two different values of best fit sphere, again, it's not the best way to compare because you will not get an accurate representation. So what you do is change the best fit sphere for comparison as we did over here. And then you see the comparison map. It shows uh, an increase in the steepness in the elevation in, in both the front and the back. Now this is progression. The, I mean, I, I'm not showing you exactly the dates that these maps were taken at, but uh, take my word for it, this is actually progression in these patients. So what next? Now there are high risk factors for progression that have already been illustrated. One is age, family history, eye rubbing, gender, allergic eye disease. All these things can, uh, and Vishal already illustrated that, the five point normogram, how we give a high risk factor scoring as well. So modifiable risk factors should be taken care of before going ahead with the cross-linking. First, you have to tackle things like eye rubbing. Tell the patient to avoid eye rubbing. Tell him to stop sleeping on a particular side. Try to tell him to sleep straight or on the other side. For inflammation, topical steroids and antihistaminic eye drops can be used. Topical cyclosporin has been illustrated earlier. And even tacrolimus recently has got into vogue. Uh, Along with that, look at serum IgE levels, an immunological opinion, a patch test can be done. And then according to that, the treatment can be tailor-made for these patients. Now this was another uh, paper that was published, a, case, a couple of cases where the IgE levels were raised. Basically these two patients were allergic to sunflower oil and sheep wool and that was actually causing the progression of uh, the keratoconus. So, Looking at progression after cross-linking, you have to take into account, like I mentioned, the repeatability of the machine, the haze. Ensure that they're good quality scans. Look for haze before commenting on progression. Wait for at least a year. Better to wait for about two years because remodeling and wound healing can occur in that amount of time. 
If there still is pro progression, control your risk factors. If, if that helps and makes it stable, you can still defer cross-linking. However, if despite that there's progression, then you can go ahead and repeat your cross-linking after a year and a half or two years. So just a case to illustrate a, the same, a 24-year-old lady uh, with a history of cross-linking done elsewhere came with a progressive diminution of vision and a change in refraction. Uh, she had a history of ocular allergy and eye rubbing, but was also planning pregnancy in the near future. These are her comparative maps between the six and the 12 months. You can see that there is a change. There's a change in the elevation as well. Increase in steep K and posterior elevation, change in the refraction, uh, a good quality scan overall. So this was showing us uh, a progression. What we did was first to advise her to control the ocular allergy and eye rubbing. Because she was planning pregnancy, we also wanted to defer the KXL till she finished this, and then after that, we were planning the cross-linking. So uh, for progression, what is that for? It's multifactorial. Uh, we have to broaden our outlook and look at systemic factors that also may be uh, influencing progression. The next step would be predicting progressive keratoconus and markers to specifically treat certain factors which can be targeted for preventing progression. Thank you. Any questions regarding progression? Any questions for Rishad? So if there is allergy, in, if you see allergy in children, and mostly in children it's allergic, allergy related. So you have to wait for decreasing the inflammation, then go for cross linking. It's not about waiting for a progression to see. So you wait for the allergy to subside, then you go ahead and uh, do the cross linking. Because children, if you do cross linking, there will be more inflammation, and in an already inflamed eye, cross linking induces more inflammation initially. So it is going to progress, and you may not get a better result. But you don't wait for six months or one year. No, no, you, to control allergy, you can wait for a month on, only. You, you start with the intensive steroid and topical steroid, and then you do the cross linking. You have to do cross linking only in a quiet eye, not in an inflamed eye. If you are doing in, so Natasha is gonna, I think, uh, yes. gonna uh, talk or, uh, about intacts. So I'm gonna invite, uh, Natasha is the next speaker. She is a robust clinician, and she's gonna uh, uh, do a, a talk on combination treatment lasers versus the rings only. Natasha. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, I would like to apologize uh, on behalf of Dr. Kalyani Deshpande. She sends her apologies for not being here today, and I'll be representing her. Uh, I would also like to thank Professor Shetty for giving us the opportunity to present some of our work which was done when we were fellows back in Naranitrale. Well, uh, the intention of this talk is just so that when we go back home, we are able to do exactly these procedures very, very simply in the clinic. So the, the question, the biggest question that we decide when we look at a keratoconus is should we burn or should we add? The so if, it, if you're burning, basically we should have enough PACI to burn. So the, the primary concern is to look at the PACI metry, and which has been very well highlighted by uh, Vishal, um, that if you have enough PACI, we do to provide a treatment. If we do not have enough PACI, we do an intax. These are uh, the uh, rings, the various sizes, the diameters of the rings. Uh, these are PMMA clear rings. The indications are very, very clear. I don't, I don't even need to go into this. Now, we are going to stepwise see how do we go ahead if we are planning for an intact. The first question is the location of the cone. Now, if uh, the most elevated uh, area is in the central 3mm, that means it's a centered cone. If it is not, then it is a decentered cone. Also, if more than 50% of the cone is in the central 3mm area, it's a centered cone, otherwise it's a decentered cone. Now, based on that, we decide if it is a centered cone, it's a symmetric ring. If it's a non, it's a decentered cone, it's a asymmetric ring. This is how we decide based on the location of the cones. Now, the second step is looking at the superior inferior asymmetry. How do we look at that? We just look at three uh, contiguous points uh, above and below um, by dividing the the coronal uh, uh, refractive map into two hemimeridians and then taking an average of them and deciding if 
uh, the, the addition, if uh, superiorly or inferiorly has a difference of more than 15 diopters, then we decide to place a single ring or an asymmetric ring. Other, if it is less than 15 diopters, then we uh, decide for an asymmetric ring. The next step is looking at the mean keratometry. Now the mean keratometry fits less than 55 a regular uh, ring and if it is more than 55 a single uh, um, NSK ring or a steep keratometric ring is what is placed. And this can be looked at any device where we take an average of K1 and K2. The next step is looking at the mean spherical refractive equivalent and the simplest part of this nomogram is that you don't even have to memorize anything. It's just mentioned everything. Every single detail is mentioned on this table and it's freely available on IGO. So based on the mean refractive spherical equivalent, uh, you decide what is going to be the size of the ring and that decides uh, the placement of the ring also. Now, once we have decided of the size of the ring, the placement, the if it's going to be asymmetric or it's going to be as, uh, the SK ring, after that we go ahead and decide where to place it. Now, that depends on the site of the incision, depends on the steep axis. Wherever is the steep axis, you just, without, uh, you know, giving it a second thought, just directly go ahead and put it in your laser machine that this is going to be where the ring is going to be placed. The, the most important factor is it has to be at the 75% depth at the 6mm zone and not the thinnest point. So you draw uh, uh, at the 6mm zones here as we can, okay. Um, so at the 6mm zones we just draw horizontal and vertical lines and anything in that circle is where we decide what is the maximum, uh, the minimum uh, the pachymetry and 75% of that. Um, this is how the planning is. Uh, these are the parameters that are entered in the, in the uh, femtosecond platform. And uh, this is how the ring placement is. Uh, most of us have seen this. It's, now this is with the um, um, rescan machine where we had interoperative OCT as well. So you open up the channels. Once the channels are open, it's much easier to slide the ring. Um, so uh, this is a special forcep that is used for the intact. It's called the Brown's forcep. It's got an indentation in the center which allows the ring to snugly fit in. And uh, we have to first hold the ring vertically and then guide it inside the channel. That is the only important step that is that should not be missed here. So that there is no uh, uh, inadvertent perforation. Also, there is no uh, de-roofing of the channel. Now, this is just uh, one or two case examples uh, which we have seen before and after the ring placement. Um, but ultimately for the visual rehabilitation, as we shall rightly mention, the contact lens or glasses are going to be the final stay. Now, after having decided if we do not have enough, if, if we do have enough package, sh what should we do? Should we burn? So how do we burn? The biggest advantage of doing topo guided treatment is that you can provide a very good quality of vision. Again, the intention is just to sensitize the cornea for a better quality of vision. We are not correcting the refractive error. So what does this basically do is neutralization, normalization, smoothing. There are various methods, various names it is called by. We have up published our article where we have, in addition to all the parameters, looked at the actual measure, that is the corneal asphericity, which is the Q value, which is the measure of irregularity. So what, it's a very simple nomogram. You look at the Q value, based on the Q value, if it is more than minus one, you do not, if, if you change it, if it is less than minus one, it is closer to normal, you do not change it. Step two, if you have pachymetry, how much will you burn? Based on the pachymetry, you decide the spherical equivalent that can be entered into the device. Now, you take the device, uh, uh, any, um, so uh, we are using the wave, wave light platform here, so it's got a placido device with which we measure this. Now, this has been, this scan is not correct, so you would want at least a 5.5 to 6 mm. Uh, coverage of the cornea. So once your scan is proper, this device uh, exports either via the server or the flash drive. Now the, this is an interactive platform that we see here. So you have to check the quality of the scans. Once that is done, the Q value has to be entered. If the Q value, as early mentioned, it is more than minus one, you bring it to less than minus one. You have enough PACI based on the PACI that the PACI has to be after deducting the epithelium. So 475 uh, was after deducting the epithelium. Um, so after that, we get a subjective refraction, which has been already mentioned before. You also get a, a column, which is of the 
uh, the axis. Now the axis has to be from the topolizer because we are correcting the topography. Then comes the modified refraction. How does that happen? You just keep the modified refraction as zero. Why do we do that? So this is when the refraction is fully uh, corrected. This is when the refraction has been modified to zero. So if you look at this, even when you don't do a refractive correction, it still is ca causing some uh, ablation. That means it's correcting the topography. Now you have to compensate for this. How do we do it? Now look at, if you look at this, the central has got a 25 micron ablation, a myopic ablation. The periphery has got 43 micron of hy hyperopic ablation. The difference is somewhere around 18 to 20 micron, which accounts for one and a half diopter. Now this one and a half diopter is going to be induced as a myopia. In, in, so the patient will be a myopic by one or one and a half diopter. Now this is just a rough estimate. Now this has to be compensated in the refractive error correction if you are planning for a, uh, a near total refractive error correction. So this is what we finally get at the end of the uh, planning. If you look at these, these are a uh, uh, few case examples where we had retained the queue and where we had changed the queue as well. Now we are, what's new in this uh, ablation profile is that we are now able to do a customized localized ablation or um, which is a very, very minimal ablation which is not touching any of the other area of the uh, cornea, keratoconic cornea. This has been possible only with the Schwind Amiris till now which, because it is able to locate which is your steepest point and then mark it. So this is what it finally looks like, the ablation profile. Uh, so it is just sort of chopping off the cone. So it gives a regularized cornea uh, and, and the epithelium sort of forms this, uh, it gives a good scaffold for the epithelium to grow over it. So what we have done in this case is that we measure the long axis and the short axis and the centration of the cone and you put this device, uh, the data in the Schwinn laser and it just ablates only this area and that's just about 70 micron trans epi, that means 50 micron of the epithelium and about 20 micron of the cone. And this is uh, followed by the conventional uh, cross-linking. The periphery is of course scraped manually and this is what it looks like. So pre-operatively and post-operatively we can see a significant difference when there is significant flattening and uh, this paper has been now published in Cornea. Um, well, it has been recently accepted in Cornea um, where they have found significant improvement in the visual quality as well as the clinical parameters and the keratometric outcomes. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. So in tax, we do the, uh, in between the rings, uh, we, the area has to be debrided and do the uh, cross-linking. Pure intacts would work for sometimes because intacts is only to give flattening. To freeze it or you say cross link, if you're not cross linking the cornea, there's always chance that it is going to progress. Initially intacts came with only this thing only. That you do intacts and you, you'll serially monitor it. But the long term study, you do a sequential or the same day cross linking and you'll, you can, you'll have a much better result. In a stretch cornea, that is why they say that it is a basically a stretched cornea. But if you do plan carefully, there will be not much of stretching and you will not lose the thickness also. So you, I, I, I have seen pure intacts also getting uh, into a progression. So it is always better to cross-link a cornea which has not been cross-linked. Or if it's an already cross-linked cornea, you don't need to cross-link again. You just do a intact. This is a point of controversy, sir. I think there are enough number of papers which go in either direction for this. Now, what we normally do is cross-link and put an intax at the same visit because that seems to make the, the most amount of sense because if you put in an intax ring after cross-linking, then you might be losing some of the effect of cross-linking. And when you do it, uh, cross-linking after intax, it doesn't, you're, it's still uh, not a virgin cornea, so you might not get the same effect. We normally prefer to do it at the same sitting to, to kind of get both the effects at the same time. So I now invite Palak to give her talk on uh, a couple of cases that she'll be presenting and followed by Aarti for the next case.
good afternoon i would be describing few unusual cases where we had to take a different approach to manage them so we see various presentations of keratoconus in our clinic and we also have various treatment options for them but are we justified looking only at the topography and treating them no the challenging cases or different cases do need out of the box approach so these are two cases one was 11 year old male presenting to us with grade 3 keratoconus and a pacchi of 410 microns another 15 year old male with grade 2 keratoconus and pacchi of 490 microns this is how the topographies of both these cases looked so most commonly all of us will go ahead and do cross linking for these patients but again are we justified doing a cross linking straight ahead no look at the history first both of them had severe allergic eye disease they were treated with all different kind of topical medications but still the allergy was not under control so what was the thing which we were missing or we were not looking at so we went ahead and did serum ige for both these cases and we found that they were significantly raised the first case has ige levels of around 2700 another around 1700 so we took immunology opinion for these high levels of ige and the immunologist went ahead and did patch test we found that both these cases the first case was allergic to sunflower and the other one was allergic to sheep wool looking at the history again and probing further we found that case 1 was in their family they were using sunflower oil for cooking and in case 2 the kid was using a uh, sheep wool sweaters very oftenly so what we did was we advised both these patient to avoid this allergen the first family changed that cooking oil to groundnut cooking oil and the second case stopped wearing those sheep wool sweaters and also the both the patients were started on oral antihistaminic treatment and was also given sublingual immunotherapy both the patients did have significant reduction in their allergy though both of them needed uh, cross linking afterwards so briefly describing ige it's a immunoglobulin isotype specific for parasitic infections and hypersensitivity type 1 it triggers release of cytokines from mast cells and basophils normal levels is around 150 to 200 again it varies according to the age and it is a least abundant isotope in blood however it may raise up to 10 folds due to trigger of any allergen this uh, two cases have dr rushad also told has been recently published and we describe the role of serum ige and avoiding allergens in these progressive keratoconus patients so if we look at this 5 point nomogram which dr vishal described the only modifiable risk factor in the whole nomogram is eye rubbing and the allergic or atopic eye disease so to begin with we also give topical steroids antihistaminic eye drops or cyclosporins when the patients are not controlled with these uh, modality of treatment we when we do go ahead and do serum ige levels for these patients take immunologist opinion and a simple avoiding allergy helps a lot in these cases to avoid eye rubbing and further progression of the disease thank you thank you palak any questions on that case if not we will proceed with the next case dr arthi agarwal from bombay will be presenting the final case palak i think you can take that question so basically it is a low dose of allergen only which is given slowly and under observation and it is given sublingually so it is given on a long term to make the patient immune to that allergen Uh, good morning everyone so before i proceed with my case i'm going to show you a short video which we are practicing in narayan netralay uh, this is uh, going to be a latest break breakthrough in the pain management in refractive surgery that is prk and in post c3r pain so b without taking much time i'm going to proceed with the video first can i have the voice over please can you play please yeah wonderful surgery can i many advantages so why did it go out
Was it due to the problem of post-operative pain? I don't think we are able to hear the voice over, is it? Most doctors were against doing PRP due to the post-operative pain. So we thought, what if we could reduce this pain? Would this procedure be more acceptable? We did a quick search on Google for commercially available painkillers and found a preservative-free option of Ketorolac called Accuvail. We used these drugs topically after surgery and noticed that the Wong Baker pain scale changed from 8, with no analgesic drops, to 6. This decrease in pain was not enough. So we wondered if we could perhaps prolong the action of Accuvail by using it in a depot form. Topical drops would wash out of the eye within minutes, but the depot would maintain the concentration of the drug for longer. To begin with, the bandage contact lens packet was cleaned with alcohol. We then waited for 5 minutes. 0.2 ml of Accuvail was injected into the BCL package. The bandage contact lens was then allowed to soak in Accuvail for 20 minutes, following which it was placed on the eye after PRK surgery. The Wong Baker pain scale this time decreased from 8 to 2. We had many questions in our minds about the ideal time for BCL soakage and the period of time the drug would continue to be released from the contact lens in therapeutic concentrations. So we performed an experiment where the Accuvail soaked bandage contact lens was placed in an Eppendorf tube and then transported to the laboratory. The contact lens was then subjected to high performance liquid chromatography which helped analyze the concentration of Accuvail at various time points. This chromatogram depicts the concentration of Accuvail at different time points and it can also be seen that the drug reaches its peak in one hour and it maintains that concentration over the six hours tested. To answer the question of why to clean the bandage contact lens surface, we did a laboratory experiment where we took a swab from the alcohol clean bandage contact lens surface and the unclean surface and cultured the same. We found that there was growth seen in the uncleaned surface. We did a study which included 70 patients divided into two treatment arms and the use of the Wong Baker pain scale. The first treatment arm included thoroughly washing the eye with cold BSS and placing a regular bandage contact lens after PRK. The second treatment arm included washing the eye with cold BSS and placing a BCL soaked in Accuvail over the eye after PRK. We found that in group 1, the Wong Baker pain scale was around 8 and in group 2, it was around 2. Pain after PRK can be a huge challenge but it can be conquered. So uh, this is basically a study which we did on PRK. The same thing has been followed for our patients' pain management post C3R. So I think we are out of time, so I'm not going to be uh, continuing with case discussion. Thank you. So any questions, just final questions and thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so ma'am, uh, we haven't followed this protocol that we've not uh, started with a low-dose steroid. We uh, first did an experiment uh, starting with a low-dose steroid as well as NSA. But we, could, we, like, uh, we had shown that the Von Baker scale was not reduced significantly. Hence, we thought that, uh, and then the second thing which we did was frequent, uh, you know, we increased the frequency of uh, topical NSA, but still that would not solve the problem. And hence, we went ahead and did this uh, experiment. No, no. Okay. And in this study, we didn't even, yeah, there was no uh, effect on healing. Uh, it was absolutely uh, uneventful. Thank you. Any questions for our first speaker, Dr. Simmons, from the first talk? Okay, then I think we can wrap up the session. Thank you for being a wonderful audience, for having a good interactive session. I thank all the speakers. And I thank Dr. Shetty for giving us the opportunity to present here. Thank you.